leave when you're in Sunday school. I've been hearing some rumors of, they're not rumors, Linda said, so. And because they're not rumors, you need to behave. And you keep them in shape. Amen. Well, did everyone enjoy their 4th of July? Amen. Many of you had cookouts and all kinds of things and did all kinds of things. Amen. But if I was to ask you the question, what does the 4th of July represent? How many of us would really and truly know? The only person I, I believe would know that is, is Brother Lloyd. He does a lot of reenactments and things. But I'm going to mention a person's name, and I want you to be honest, and I want you to please, I uh, want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Good to have you with us this morning. But if I'm going to, I'm going to mention this person's name, and when I do, I want you to tell me the word that comes to your mind first. And I want you all to yell it out. Can you do that for me? Okay, are you ready? When I mention his name, I want you to yell out what first comes to your mind. Okay, got it? Okay. Samuel Adams. Huh? What comes to your mind? Well, at least they're being honest. That's a, they're beer. Or as Linda says, bear. When I mention the name Samuel Adams, automatically we think of beer. But Samuel Adams is more than just beer. He was a politician in colonial Massachusetts. He was a leader of the moment that became the American Revolution and one of the uh, architects of the principles of the American Republic, Republic that shaped the political culture of the United States. He was a second cousin to fellow founding father, President John Adams. He was very, very instrumental in the revolution that took place. But Samuel Adams was also a Christian statesman. And not yielding to the fatigue in the vineyard of liberty, he knew that the foundation of American government depended upon the Christian character of its people. Hear me now. The liberty which America has established was based upon the foundation of Christian character of our people. The title of my message this morning is The Vineyard of Liberty. The Vineyard of Liberty. That is a vineyard picture that is found in Israel. I believe in the desert area. The vineyard of liberty. Now Samuel Adams also said this, and I want to quote him. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. But once they lose their virtue, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. Let me say that again so you can register that and get that in your mind. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. When you look at America today and you see virtue is gone, what is virtue? Virtue is, in definition, conforming to moral and ethical principles, morally excellent, upright, leading to a virtuous life. If we look at America today and we wonder why there's such an assault on the Christian Judeo values, it's because people have lost their virtue. They have lost morality. They have lost the excellency 
of moral and ethical principles. And because of that, because of that, America is in a slow declining spiral downward. I never thought I'd see the day where we would have legalized marijuana or legalized recreational marijuana. Where now they're getting ready to have retail stores where you can actually walk in and buy marijuana. I never thought I'd see the day in the open of same-sex marriage being accepted by government. A government that was formed on Christianity, on the Bible. You say, but what about church separation of church and state? Can I tell you the Bible's all over the state? It's all over Washington. They have a statue of Moses in the Capitol building. Come on, somebody. Our very Ten Commandments of the Scriptures are woven into our society's laws. If you kill someone, the, law, the, the, the police will come and arrest you. If you steal, the police will come and arrest you. If you lie, upon, if you lie on, the, on the stand in a courtroom, you will be prosecuted. Where do you think that law came from? The law came from the Ten Commandments. So I don't know where they get the separation of church and state from. But when a society begins to lose its virtue, virtue is life, health. It's the same way with a vineyard. If a vineyard is not taken care of properly, what will happen is if it's not getting its proper nutrition, its proper watering, irrigation, or sometimes even some fertilizer necessary to put in the nutrients back into the ground, excuse me, what will happen is you'll go expecting to find a grape and you'll find a raisin. <laughs> it's all shriveled up. They're dried up. Or they've been eaten by worms or in, 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 in insects. And that's exactly what's happening in America. In America today, it's getting eaten up by these insects of demonic infested, infested people that hate the Constitution, that hate the law of God, that hate Christianity. I want you to understand it's worldwide, it's not just in our country. I want you to understand that right now, how many have your Bibles with you? If you have your Bibles with you, raise your Bibles. I'm going to be getting into the scripture in a minute. You have your Bible? In the nation of China, just you holding up that Bible and showing that Bible, you'll spend two years in prison and hard labor. Are you hearing me? I want you to think about that. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Bible says, remembering those that are in prison. Remembering them. Pray for them. That they're serving in prisons two years just for owning a Bible. That's not even speaking about the Bible. That's just having it in your possession. And if they find you and come into your home and find that you have a Bible, you'll spend two years in prison. Hey, Brother Kevin, how are you? He's going back to China. Better hide your Bible, brother. I mean, think about it. We had an uh, American that was there and just took one of the posters down and was going to keep it as a souvenir. He got so severely beaten and tortured. He lost his life when he came back to America. He died. He was so sick. Over a poster. Imagine about the Word of God. We have a vineyard of liberty here in the United States. But if we lose that virtue, if we've totally lost that virtue, 
We will surrender our liberties to the first external or internal invader. Think about it. Where's the church standing now on abortion? They have abortion rallies, very few are showing up now. Where are those that are standing for same-sex marriage and saying, no, it's wrong? Where are they today? There are more standing up for it than there are against it. And the reason why is because the church has lost its virtue. The, law, the church has lost its morality. The church has lost the moral convictions and ethical principles. There are people in the church that are living together. There are people in the church that are fornicating. There are people in the church that don't care about God. They just come to be religious. And we wonder why society's in the condition that it's in. And personally, I blame the church. Because the church has not been a light unto darkness. We've hidden our light under a bush. We've hidden our light under the bed. We very seldom speak about Jesus to the world anymore. And so we don't let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We become a socialized club. Bless us for no more. Come into church when we feel like it. Come on, somebody, give me an amen, something, otherwise I'm going to go home. How true it is the scripture found in Psalm 11, verse 3. I'll wait for pastor to put that up there. How true this scripture is. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations of ethical, moral, moral principles are being lightly esteemed and destroying the very foundation of our country, it's destroying the very foundation of the church. What can the righteous do? The righteous won't stand up. If the righteous won't stand up, and make a difference. It's sad when you mention the name Samuel Adams and beer comes to your mind first. Why? Because the enemy, Satan, has taken the very history, of the very core of this nation, the very history, and through liberalism and liberal professors in colleges have changed history that people don't even know Samuel Adams except for a beer. They don't even know their constitutional rights. They don't know the uh, Declaration of Independence. They have not a clue. And so what happens is, is when you are willing to sacrifice that, it's because we've sacrificed our moral and ethical objectivity. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? But I'm talking about the vineyard of liberty. I'm talking about being a free people in Christ. I'm talking about enjoying the, the, the freedom that Jesus gives us and what we do with that freedom. According to the International Standard Bible uh, Encyclopedia, it says this, liberty, the opposite of servitude or bondage, hence applicable to cap captives or slaves set free from oppression. Are you at liberty today? Have you been set free from oppression? Have you been set free, hallelujah, by being a bond, a, a slave to sin? Have you been free from the power which enslaved you? Liberty consists not simply in external freedom or in a possession of the formal powers of choice. 
but in deliverance from the darkening of the mind, the tyranny of sinful lusts, an enthrallment of the will, and induced by a morally corrupt state. That's what you've been set free from. Hallelujah. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Romans 8.21, talking about liberty. It's so foreign to many people what liberty is. Sometimes liberty thinks, people think that liberty is, you can do whatever you want to do. Let me ask you the question, can you? Well, you can, but you've got to pay the consequence. There's always a consequence to liberty. There's always restrictions to liberty, and there's always boundaries to liberty. What do I mean by that? Well, I just can't go out and shoot Joe if I feel like shooting him. There's boundaries to my liberty. I'm free to do that, but guess what? I've got to pay the consequence of doing a, such an action. And see, what's happening in society today, and you see it a lot in young people, you see them wanting to be free. And I remember back in the 60s, we wanted to be free, remember? We had free sex, free drugs, all that stuff, going out way, the long hippie movements and all that stuff. And what happened? What happened to society? We started to downspin. Because we did liberty without any borders, liberty without any protection, liberty without any responsibility or accountability. One of the great abuses of liberty has this phrase in their, in their thinking. No one is going to tell me what to do. Even God can't tell them what to do. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of of God. As children of God, you and I have such great liberty. Now that liberty doesn't mean that you can go out and do whatever you want to do. You can go out and sin and, and, and do whatever you want to. Or if you feel like going to church, or if you feel like not going to church, or if you feel like praying, or you don't feel like praying, or you feel like reading your Bible, or you don't feel like reading your Bible, that's not liberty! That's rebellion. Hello? Because of the freedoms that we have. I was sharing with somebody on Facebook. Say, they said, I'm a Christian, therefore we're not to judge. And I said, read your Bible. I said, because 1 Corinthians would contradict what you just said. That we're to judge those that are within, not those that are without. We are to judge. But that's the big thing in society right now. Don't judge. Then take all the judges out of the courts. Why have them judge people? Why? Because there's boundaries in liberty. There's responsibilities in liberty. Come on, somebody. We've got to have boundaries. We've got to have rules and regulations. Every day I see somebody opposing the wall down in the southern border there. Don't want a wall. Everybody marching. Don't want a wall. Don't separate people. No wall. We, we don't want any walls. Democrats don't want no walls. I wrote on Facebook. I said, then fine. Take all the doors off your house. Leave the doors wide open. And let anybody that wants to come in, come in. Leave your car doors unlocked at night. Take your fences down in your yard. Come on, somebody.
We have liberty as children of God. But our liberty must be within the boundaries, within the confines, if you will, of this Bible. Can I tell you, churches today are doing away with the Bible. They're going by feelings and emotions and giving you little tiny, little, in, you know, little tiny uh, nuggets, if you will, of a message of 20 minutes. People can't stay in church more than an hour today. But they can sit at a ball game for two and a half hours. They can watch a movie for two and a half hours. Come on, somebody. If they're doing something, they can be involved in that activity for hours. But they can't come to church for an hour and a half or two hours or two and a half hours. Why? Because the spirit and the flesh, they fight against each other. The flesh wants to put you in bondage, keep you out of God's house, keep you away from the things of God, keep you away from God's people. It's sad when you have a church that doesn't interact with each other. And it's sad when they do, all they do is gossip about one another and talk about one another. Hello? That's not what the church is for, to call up and gossip. In fact, the Bible says in Corinthians, we're to judge a person that, that gossips. And if they don't repent, we're, tell, we're to tell them to leave the church. Just like one that had a stepmother was having sex. Read the context in 1 Corinthians. Even those that are covetous, the church is supposed to discipline them and tell them, listen, either repent or leave. Come on, somebody. But see, the church today accepts everything and everything because they're doing away with this word. They don't want this. You go to a lot of churches today and you tell them about Jesus. I talked to somebody. Goes to one of the biggest churches in this area. I asked them if they were born again. They said no. I know someone down in Texas goes to a huge church, 25,000 people. Corresponded through a, a Facebook Messenger. I asked her, I said, are you born again? She said, no, but I'm a Christian. You can't be a Christian without being born again. But I understood what she was saying. She was religious. She was a religious person. Can I tell you, a religious person won't make it to heaven. Only those who are born again will go to heaven. Liberty as resulting from the possession of the Spirit of God, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, that doesn't mean that liberty is you can get up and act like a fool. Please understand one thing. If God's spirit begins to move and you start walking around here quacking like a duck, I'm going to shut you up. If you start roaring like a lion and walking on all fours... And someone's got a leash around your neck and leading you around. This pastor will stop you. Thank you, honey. Because that's not of God. How do you know that, pastor? Because my Bible says that the Spirit does things decently and in order. Now, I'm not talking about a, shoot, uh, a shout or a, a holler or a woo. Or, I'm not talking about that. 
I'm talking about stupid things. We had a woman one time come into our assembly. She was dressed like an Israelite. Never been to our church before. I don't know if it was when the music started or when we were, I began to preach. She began to dance down the aisle. I don't know if it was you, Bob, or someone else, I told. So go tell that person to sit down. Maybe I said to her, Sister, you need to sit down. She never came back. First time in the church. You don't do that. Oh, but she had liberty. No, she didn't have liberty. Hallelujah. Last time I checked, God doesn't sidestep his leadership. Hello? The Bible says, obey those that have the rule over you. Does, people, does, does, does leadership have the rule over you? Some of you act so like rebellious, doing your own thing. You hear the word all the time preached from this pulpit, and you go out and do your own thing. Are you listening to authority in your life? Believe me, I'm not going to tell you what color pants to wear, what shoes to wear. I'm not going to tell you the woman to put wigs on, put makeup on. I'm not going to tell you those things. That's none of my business. But when it comes to the things of God, and it comes to God, and it comes to this house, and it comes to you lying to my face. Hello? Thank you. We need to exert the authority that God has given us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I saw something on um, Facebook. Somebody put up a tent and said, we're having revival this week. That's not revival. Putting up a tent and singing songs and, and having a, a tent full of Christians is not revival. I don't care who they are. I don't care who they're attached to. I don't care what denomination they are. Man cannot make revival. Only God can send revival. It's a holy thing that God does. Hallelujah. And he does it according to this word. Come on, somebody. We need a genuine revival today if we ever needed one. But it's only going to start with repentance. Because let me tell you, when revival comes, you will begin to experience real liberty. Liberty to be free from yourself and the sinful ways and sinful choices. You'll be at liberty to serve him and want to serve him and to love him and want to be with him and want to worship him and want to come into his presence. And you can't wait to get to church. You can't wait to be in God's presence. We started out with seven in prayer. Maybe five would come, seven would come in prayer. We're over, almost 20, over 20 now. And we don't have a program set. We don't have anything set. We just worship God. We come and restore this altar. We restore the altar of God. Come on, somebody. We come to this altar and we begin to pray. We begin to say, God, I don't want anything but you. I'm tired of asking for things. And that's all I do in prayer is go and ask for things and, and to do this and do that and, and save this and save and help this and help that and make this and make that. God, we're just coming for you. We're coming here for you. We need that. To experience true liberty. Liberty is far different in God's eyes than your eyes and my eyes. He sets us free. He sets us free to be able to serve him.
He sets us free so that we can surrender to him. He sets us free so that we can be mindful of him. He sets us free so that we can go out and share him with the world. He sets us free from shame. He sets us free from being ashamed of sharing the gospel. He sets us free from that. He sets us free from our own selfishness. He sets us free to be obedient to him. Hallelujah. The instrument through which liberty is imparted is the truth. Is the truth. If you look at churches today, it's all about me. It's all about you. I'm getting you out in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Give you the flickering lights and Different color lights. I'm not against different color lights, but come on. I am against painting the platform black. What does light have to do with darkness? I do have something about taking away the cross. I do have something against taking away the pulpit. I do have something against men that will stand there with jeans that have got holes in them that you can see through them. The shirt's untucked. Sleeves up, up rolled. You say, well, that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. You show me a Levite priest that di they didn't dress different than the congregation. God told me they had to have a breastplate on. They had to have an a ephod on. Come on, somebody. Jesus said, let everything be done decently and in order. To be modest. I'm not saying you have to have a tie on. But look your best. Whatever your best is, look your best. Oh, that's legalism, Pastor. No, it ain't legalism. It's what's right in God's house. Just remember where you're going. You're not going to the show. You're not going for entertainment. You're not going to bring attention to yourself. You're going to the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Leviticus 25, verse 10. And you shall hollow or make hallowed or honored the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof it shall be a jubilee unto you and you shall return every man unto his possession and you shall return every man unto his family oh do we need a year of jubilee from the Lord come on somebody please we need a jubilee from the Lord but can I tell you that the Lord already gave us a jubilee? Many people missed it. Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples to what? Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endured with power from on high. Can I tell you the word Pentecost means 50. It was 50 days from that time when the disciples went into the upper room. It was 50 days later that all of a sudden, the Bible says, suddenly there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. And that wind blew over them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That was their jubilee. Hallelujah. That was their freedom. That was their liberty. Hallelujah. The Jubilee. Look what the world did to many of you 
who suffered in so much need and poverty almost. Look at where you were a few years ago, struggling, not able to make ends meet. And then you got saved, and then you got filled with the Holy Ghost, and God began to restore, hallelujah, everything, possessions, that you sh and returned you back to your family, your Christian family. Do you remember where you were? Do you remember that cafeteria? Do you remember the financial struggles? But when you came and experienced the year of Jubilee, you got saved and then you got filled with the Holy Ghost. Now you're free to worship. Now you're free to serve him. And now I proclaim to you what he said, that every man unto his possession and every one shall return every man to his family. This is your family. It's sad that society has programmed us to not get in touch with our family. Before I was a Christian, I very seldom get together with my family, my, my, my earthly family. I can't remember maybe 10, 15 times in my whole life that we were together. Maybe funerals, weddings. How, come on, how, how many can I identify? Funerals and weddings, we all got together. We said, oh, we got to get together soon, but we never did. We don't call each other. We don't talk to each other. We can't even go out to dinner with our spouse without getting on this thing. Come on, somebody. We can't leave the house without these. If we go down the road a mile and we forget our phone, we go home and get it. If we leave our Bible at home and we go a mile, we say, I'll forget it. Come on. James 1.25 says this. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. You know, there's a law of liberty. And continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. When you're at liberty, it doesn't mean that you can do whatever you feel like it. Or if a brother or sister needs your assistance, if you feel like it, you will. No. The perfect law of liberty says that you don't forget don't be a forgetful hearer, but a doer. Your liberty will cause you to do. Not mentioning any names. But one year was someone's birthday. The Lord told me, go all the way to East Providence and buy a cake for this person. Hello? And I went and got the cake and came back. Can I tell you, I didn't argue with God. You know why I didn't argue with God? Because I love that sister or brother. It wasn't even a thought to say no. I know it was going to bring pleasure to that, si that sister or brother. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. And I went all the way to East Providence, came all the way home. What was the, what was the real issue? What was the real thing God was trying to do? What was the real issue there? 
that my example to that person would show the love of Christ and that they would reduplicate what I did. It's not just a good gesture. It's so that we will duplicate as a living epistle. People will see what we do and will say, God, if they can do that out of love, I want that kind of love. Come on, somebody. But whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Galatians 5.1 says this. Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's entangling you from your liberty to be all that Christ wants you to be? What is entangling you? What is causing you to go back and to be entangled into bondage again? What is it? Only you know, and God knows. But you need to stand fast in the liberty that God has given you. The liberty of being free from sin. I guess a couple of months ago I asked, here in this assembly, I asked, how many of you are sinners? And, and I said, raise your hands. And a good two-thirds of you raised your hand. I said, come forward to get saved. Stand therefore in the liberty where Christ has made you free. He's made you free from the power of sin. He's made you free to be able to obey him. He's made you free to be able to read the Bible. He's made you free to be able to pray. He's made you free to be able to sing. He made you free to be able to lift your hands. He made you free that you can serve him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. He's made you free. But let me repeat it again. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. But once they lose their virtue, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. How about Satan himself? An internal invader. Telling you to lose your moral objectivity. Look what he's done in society by saying there are no absolutes. There's no moral objectivity. Whatever feels good, do it. That was the 60s. It was a philosophy back then. Whatever you want to do, you do it. You're a free person. You can do whatever you want to do. But as a Christian, how has Satan invaded your space and has lied to you? Come on, think about it. Think about when you were fir a first Christian, you were first. You wouldn't watch certain things on television. You would only watch G movies, general. And back in the early days, PG meant parental guidance. It was okay, it wasn't bad, but today PG is almost like R-rated. But slowly as you allow the principles and the virtues and the, moral, and the moral objectivity to slip from you, you are watching things on television that at one time you would never watch. You are allowing things in your life and in your mind at one time you would not allow that to happen. Because you have 
an adversary that wants to hold you in bondage and bring you back to bondage and take you to that place of disobedience to Christ. Don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, in this particular context, Paul's talking about the context of the Jews and the Gentiles and being saved and being put under uh, bondage to the law. <clears throat> excuse me, to the law. Being put under bondage to circumcision. Being put under the bondage to Judaism. But we can apply that today to our life. I want to be in the vineyard of liberty. You notice a vineyard, you're not alone. You know, in the vineyard, there's many, 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 many fruits in the vineyard. In the, in the great vineyard, there's many grapes, and they're all bunched together, and they're all hanging together. Can I say that? When's the last time you took time to go be with somebody from our church? When's the last time you called somebody up and said, hey, let's go have a sandwich. Let's go to, for a walk in the park. Let's go for a walk down by the water. Let's go do something together. Let's go, let's pray together. Let's read the Bible together. Not talk about so and so and what this one's did and that one's doing and what that person did and he's backslidden and no, 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 no. When's the last time you called somebody in this church and said, hey, let's get together. Let's have some fellowship. Let's talk about the things of God. I remember years ago, years and years ago, and Debbie will remember this, when we used to leave church, we used to go to Dunkin' Donuts or somewhere, and we'd sit there for hours. Remember? We'd just talk about the Lord, and we'd just share. We were so excited about the things of God and what God was doing. His spirit was moving. Hours. I remember sometime church would get out at 10. We wouldn't get home until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. We were excited about God. Where is that zeal gone? Somebody say, oh, you got mature. No, no, don't ever lose your zeal. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you you've got to lose your zeal. The only thing is we need to lose is not having the wisdom that we need when you have zeal. See, when we first got saved, we had zeal. We, we, we didn't have much wisdom. At least I didn't. You know, we go anywhere and say anything, you know. I'm going to go to hell. We need wisdom. Galatians 5.13 says this. Now, I just want to say this. It's too late for this, but don't go rushing up now and do this. But my water person failed me today. Galatians 5.13. For brethren, you have been called. Do you know you're called to liberty? You're called. God wants to, he's calling you to be, li to be at liberty. He's given you liberty. He's saying, I've given you liberty. That's freedom. Now understand, that's not to do whatever you want. But liberty. He's called you to liberty. But he says, only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love to serve one another. Can I tell you that's what liberty does? That's the work of liberty? But by love serve one another? Last night I got a surprise. I was home and I got a call and somebody said, I made some pastelitos. Is that how you say them? Would you like some? I wasn't really feeling that well, but I said, yes, I'll take it, because I'll eat it later. That was a kind thing to do. That was a liberty of love serving one another. We celebrated the 4th of July. We had our hot dogs and hamburgers and salad, whatever you had. 
without really knowing what it means to be at liberty. We really don't know what it meant to be free. You know, I'm saddened by the national anthem when people kneel. When that flag is waving and they kneel. And you would say to me, well, pastor, that's their freedom. No, that's their right. No, it is not. They haven't got a right to protest the flag in the national anthem. It's not an individual anthem. It's a national anthem of, of responding to, when we sing that national anthem, it's responding to the very lives that were, that were given for that freedom and to respect that life. So I'm going to play a little video for you in closing. About, it's about 9, 10, 11, 10 minutes, something like that. But what the flag really represents, I, I want to say this, and I don't care if people get mad at me, okay? But there was a ceremony, uh, I think it was in 2014, 15, 16, around there. There was a ceremony flag day. And President Obama and his wife were up on the platform. And during the ceremony of the flag, you know, they have a certain way they fold the flag. And, it, and it, every fold means something. I don't know if you know that. But every single fold that they fold means something. And so as they were honoring the flag, Michelle Obama leans over to her husband. And they got a real close-up shot of this. And she said, all this for a damn flag. People said, that's not what she said. That's, that's not what she said. Well, you know what they did? They went and hired a professor that, that taught sign language and, and reading of lips. And he, they slowed the tape down. They slowed it down three, three, four times. And he was able to read her lips. He said, that's exactly what she said. All this for a damn flag. So what I like to do is I like to play this video. And, and then when it's right when it, they're done talking, they're going to they're gonna sing the national anthem. Can we all stand for that? Is anyone going to kneel? If you're going to kneel, go outside. Okay. I don't think, I think, let it go. See what happens. It's from YouTube. It's not from ourselves. So. There was a lawyer once. His name was Francis Scott Key. He penned a song that I'm sure you're aware of. You've seen it. It's in most hymnals throughout our churches. It's called the National Anthem. It is our song as an American. We go, however, to a ball game. We stand in our church services and we sing the words of that song. And they float over our minds and our lips and we don't even realize what we're singing. Most of us have memorized it as a child, but we've never really thought about what it means. Let me tell you a story. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer in Baltimore. The colonies were engaged in vicious conflict with the mother country, Britain. Because of this conflict and the protractedness of it, they had accumulated prisoners on both sides. The American colonies had prisoners and the British had prisoners. And the American government initiated a move. They went to the British and they said, let us negotiate for the release of these prisoners. They said, we want to send a man out to discuss this with you. They were holding the American prisoners in boats about a thousand yards offshore. And they said, we want to send a man by the name of Francis Scott Key. He will come out and negotiate to see if we can make a mutual exchange. On the appointed day in a rowboat, he went out to this boat and he negotiated with the British officials. And they reached a conclusion that men could be exchanged on a one-for-one -one basis. Francis Scott Key, jubilant with the fact that he'd been successful, went down below in the boats, and what he found was a cargo hold full of humanity, men. And he said, men, I've got news for you tonight. You're free. He said, tonight I have negotiated successfully your return to the colonies. He said, you'll be taken out of this boat, out of this filth, out of your chains. As he went back up on board to arrange for their passage to the shore, the admiral came and he said, we have a slight problem. He said, we will still honor our commitment to release these men, but it'll be merely academic after tonight. It won't matter. And Francis Scott Key said, what do you mean? He said, well, Mr. Key, he said, tonight we have laid an ultimatum upon the colonies. 
your people will either capitulate and lay down the colors of that flag that you think so much of, or you see that fort right over there, Fort Henry? He said, we're going to remove it from the face of the earth. He said, how are you going to do that? He said, if you will, scan the horizon of the sea. And as he looked, he could see hundreds of little dots. And he said, that's the entire British war fleet. He said, all of the gunpowder, all of the armament is being called upon to demolish that fort. It will be here within striking distance in a matter of about two and a half hours. He said, the war is over. These men would be free anyway. He said, you can't shell that fort. He said, that's, that's a large fort. He said, it's full of women and children. He says, it's predominantly not a military fort. He said, don't worry about it. They said, we've left them a way out. And he said, what's that? He said, do you see that flag way up on the rampart? He said, we have told them that if they will lower that flag, the shelling will stop immediately. And we'll know that they've surrendered, and you'll now be under British rule. Francis Scott Key went down below and told the men what was about to happen. And they said, how many ships? He said, hundreds. The ships got closer. Francis Scott Key went back up on top, and he said, men, I'll shout down to you what's going on as we watch. As twilight began to fall, and as the haze hung over the ocean as it does at sunset, suddenly the British war fleet unleashed. <clears throat> he says the sound was deafening. There were so many guns that there were no reliefs. He said it was absolutely impossible to talk or hear. He said suddenly the sky, although dark, was suddenly lit. And he says from down below, all he could hear the men, the prisoners, saying was, tell us where the flag is. What have they done with the flag? Is the flag still flying over the rampart? Tell us. One hour, two hours, three hours into the shelling. Every time the bomb would explode and it would be close to the flag, they could see the flag in the illuminated red glare of that bomb. And Francis Scott Key would report down to the men below, it's still up. It's not down. The admiral came and he said, your people are insane. He said, what's the matter with them? He said, don't they understand this is an impossible situation? Francis Scott Key said, he remembered what George Washington had said. He said, the thing that sets the American Christian apart from all other people in the world is he will die on his feet before he'll live on his knees. The Admiral said, we have now instructed all of the guns to focus on the rampart to take that flag down. He said, we don't understand something. Our reconnaissance tells us that that flag has been hit directly again and again and again, and yet it's still flying. We don't understand that. But he said, now we're about to bring every gun for the next three hours to bear on that point. Francis Scott Key said the barrage was unmerciful. All that he could hear was the men down below praying. The prayer. God, keep that flag flying where we last saw it. Sunrise came. He said there was a heavy mist hanging over the land, but the rampart was tall enough. There stood the flag completely nondescript in shreds. The flagpole itself was at a crazy angle, but the flag was still at the top. Francis Scott Key went aboard and immediately went into Fort Henry to see what had happened. And what he'd found had happened was that that flagpole and that flag had suffered repetitious direct hits. And when hit had fallen. But men, fathers, who knew what it meant for that flag to be on the ground, 
although knowing that all of the British guns were trained on it, walked over and held it up humanly until they died. Their bodies were removed and others took their place. Francis Scott Key said what held that flagpole in place at that unusual angle were patriots' bodies. He penned the song, O oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Or the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that the flag was still there. Oh say, does that star-spangled banner yet fly and wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? The debt was demanded, the price it was paid. Oh say, can you see? By the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the pale piece of cloth. It represents freedom, liberty. It represents lives that were given. Rather than to surrender that flag, they would not bring that flag down to touch the ground. That's why it's, it's a called the desecration. If you desecrate the flag by putting it on the ground, it means you are surrendering. And that's what, the, that's what we don't want to see is America surrender. So when people disrespect the flag, that's what they're dis disrespecting. Those men that took that flag and held it up with their very lives. And when those bombs around them went off, they lost their life. But they kept that flag up. And that's what the national anthem is all about. It's about the liberty and the freedom that we can have because of men giving up their life. <laughs> 
And the same in Christianity. Understand that that flag represents Christianity too. Because this nation was founded on Christian principles. We have our Christian flag. But it's not superior to the flag that was put upon this nation to separate from the, the dictatorship, if you will, of the King of England so that we could be a free people and we could have a commonwealth, a republic, where the people rule the government, not the government ruling the people. And it was for this freedom that we stand. It is from this freedom, and it's played at a ballpark, that we stand. We don't kneel and disrespect what that flag represents. And that's exactly what happens when people kneel and don't respect every, they don't respect the history of that flag. So while we're all standing, I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that today, God, we will recognize the liberty that you gave your life when the enemy attacked and came to destroy us and to rob us from eternal life. You came down from heaven's glory. You took on human flesh. You suffered, went through being tempted like we are, yet without sin, but you went through heartache and sorrow and loneliness you knew what it was like, God. And then you went in the hands of the Romans and Jews. You were crucified. And you suffered and died to render our enemy powerless over our lives. And to set at liberty those that were captive. Thank you for the liberty that is in you, Jesus. We thank you this morning. Come on, church. Just thank him. Thank him for the liberty that you've been set free this morning. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, Father. And we ask, Lord, as we go our separate ways today, that we'll remember the 4th of July, the, the battle for independence, what that flag means, that we'll never look at it differently again. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Keep us safe as we go. Lord, I pray that you'll cause a stirring in your people, Lord, to do the work of liberty, to come and be a part of what you're doing, Father, and that we will pray together and we will fellowship together with one another and we will love one another. Father, I pray that you give them traveling mercy. Surround them with your holy angels. Bless their going in, their coming out, their rising down and their rising up. Go before them, behind them, to the left and to the right of them. And bless them the rest of this week. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Fellowship with one another before.